today, we are thrilled to welcome Sarah Ennie, Samaya Dowd, and Kendara Blake in celebration of Sarah's debut novel, Tell Me Everything. Sarah Ennie has come a long way from her first writing job, a journalism gig covering the radioactive waste industry. <laughs> she now writes novels and produces and hosts the First Draft podcast, where she encourages other writers to spill their juicy secrets. She lives in Los Angeles with her cat, Hammer, and is very likely eating enchiladas right now. <laughs> Not enchiladas right now, we have lobster, maybe later today, who knows? Uh, Tell Me Everything is her first novel. You can learn more at sarahenny.com and on Twitter and Instagram, at Sarah Enny. Samaya Dowd is the internationally best-selling author of Mirage, the first in a space fantasy trilogy. She is currently receiving her PhD from the University of Washington and was previously a bookseller at Politics and Prose. Mirage is her debut. And Kendara Blake is the author of the number one New York Times best-selling Three Dark Crowns series, the Anna Dressed in Blood duo, and the Goddess of War trilogy. She lives in western Washington and on, on the peninsula, sort of, uh, and likes animals food, and people who like animals and food, <laughs> usually in that order. Just a few more announcements before I turn things over. Books are on the cubes just behind you. You'll also see some sugary treats. Those are free. Those are for eating. Y'all should eat some sugar. <laughs> you can purchase them at any register. The closest, if you don't want to go downstairs, is in the tech center just over there. If you need parking validated, come see me after the event. I have the magic stamp. But now, please join me in welcoming Sarah Emmy, Samaya Dab, and Kendara Blake. Do you, do you want to, is this on? It is. <laughs> um, you should start with introducing your book. Yeah, yeah, I think we're going to go down. Um, there's like so many microphones up here. We're recording this for first draft also, so that's why uh, this is all going on. Uh, it looks kind of ridiculous, but it's for a good cause. Um, but yeah, I think we're all going int to like, introduce and talk about the books that we're mostly going to be discussing today. So I'll talk about Tell Me Everything, which just came out last Tuesday. Um, it is a contemporary novel, and it's a story of a 15-year-old girl named Ivy who is an artist. She's a photographer and... Uh, visual artist, and she is too shy to share her work with anybody um, until, the, uh, well, she's too shy. And then she gets obsessed with an app, a social media app that um, kind of takes over her school. It allows people to post anonymously, and she gets really obsessed with what people are posting and wants to do nice things for them. And in the process of doing nice things for these people, she crosses all kinds of boundaries um, and learns uh, that that is fraught. <laughs> So that's Tell Me Everything. Uh, the Three Dark Crown series is a dark fantasy set on an island where in every generation a set of triplet queens is born, and each one can have a different magical gift, but unfortunately for them, tradition mandates that when they turn 16, they just have to murder the crap out of each other to find <laughs> out who gets to be the next queen. So... Um. <coughs> uh. Well, it's just not quite as exciting as that. Um, it is a space fantasy about um, an 18-year-old girl named Emmanuel who lives on a moon that orbits a larger planet, and both the moon and the planet have been colonized by the Vath, um, an invading alien force. And um, on her 18th, on the, the eve of a coming-of-age ceremony, she's kidnapped and taken to the Imperial Palace, where she realizes that she looks like the Imperial Princess, and she has to be her body double. Um, and she gets pulled into all sorts of like palace politics. Um, and a resistance and all of that. I, my book is contemporary and very much about like a young girl who likes Jeff Goldblum. It's kind of like... I wore the shirt. <laughs> you would, oh my God, like, that's amazing. <laughs> yes. Um, but I love to read fantasy and these two ladies have written some of my favorite fantasy books. So basically I came out with a book just so that I'd, I could force them to be on a stage with me and we could <laughs> talk about mur murdering queens and whatnot. <laughs> Um, so let's start easy. Um, we all sort of have like really well-drawn worlds, even the contemporary ones, because yours is set in a fictional town. Um, so before we go to world building, let's talk inspiration. Like what are the things when you sat down to write about Ivy or write about your three dark queens, what are the things that you were like, these are the things that I want to pull together into this book, or these are the things that are sort of constantly hovering in the back of my mind? 
Yeah, that's an interesting question for Tell Me Everything because I kind of had to rewrite this book twice, <laughs> um, like in a really intense way. And the, the draft that stuck was the draft where I really explicitly threw things about myself in there. So the book takes place in a town called Sudden Cove, which is loosely based on San Santa Cruz, California, which is close to where I grew up um, and went to high school. And so I have really like very personal fond feelings about that town. It's a really strange, kind of weird, fun place. Um, so I put myself in it in that way. And also she loves Jeff Goldblum, that's me. She goes to a Bigfoot museum. I went to the Big Book Bigfoot Museum. Um, there's a lot of things in there. Her skincare routine, like what she does before she goes to sleep, she listens to like whale songs or something. And I was like, yeah, okay, that's, it's all me. So a lot of the world building was putting in some of my favorite things. And I really felt more connected to the world and the town in that way. I wanted Sudden Cove to feel like the stars hollow of the West Coast. And that was my kind of driving force. It had a nice feel. Thank you. Like it's very like, Hmm. I could vacation in this place. <laughs> this is nice. And you'd leave believing in weird things. And I was going to ask you if the Bigfoot Museum was, was real. So real. And the, the scene in the book where they go to the Bigfoot Museum is basically me and my friend, fellow YA author Kirsten Hubbard, went to this museum, met this guy who looked like George R. R. Martin, who told us that Bigfoot is an interdimensional time traveler. Like, that <laughs> is what happened in my life. Are you sure it wasn't George R. R. Martin? It, the only thing that would make that story better is if it was actually George R. R. Martin. We know he's not writing books right now, so. Well, yeah, and you know, I mean, very few people, I think, look exactly like George R. R. Martin. So and he was wearing a hat and everything. With a little hat. It's probably him. Now that's the story. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Someday you'll have to ask him. <laughs> was yes, it you? One day. <laughs> what about your world building? Uh, oh, hmm. Uh, I don't know. Um. Three Dark Crowns, normally, normally when somebody asks, like, oh, where'd you get your idea? How were you inspired? I don't have any answers. Because it, it comes from such a, like, a random spot over a couple of years that I can't remember. When it finally comes together, I can't remember where the threads came from. But with Three Dark Crowns, um, I've got this B story. <laughs> Sorry if you've heard it before. <laughs> I tell it a lot. So I was at a book event in 2013, and there was a swarm of bees right outside the store, like right in between the store and the hot dog truck, which I really wanted to get to. And it was like a ball of bees, about the size of your head, just made out of 100% bees. And we're like, ah, crap, cancel the event. All the children are going to be killed. But there happened to be a beekeeper there, and she said, don't worry. When bees are in a ball like that, they're traveling to a new hive. In the center of the ball is their queen, and their only concern is protecting her. So you can, you know, as long as you don't poke it, <laughs> you can go as close to it as you want, really, because they're not really paying much attention. Um, so I was fascinated by this bee ball because it seems like a really inconvenient way to travel for one. Like every time she has to go to Target, she's like, children, oh, <laughs> on me. Um, and also I was fascinated by this beekeeper because I'd never met one before. So I peppered her with all these bee questions all day long, this poor woman. We're friends now, it's fine. Um, <laughs> but she told me a number of things about bees, but she also told me that a, a queen bee will leave her hive for many reasons. But before she goes, she'll lay four or five baby queen eggs. Up until this point, she's just been laying worker eggs because that's all she needs. And then, you know, but now she's like, ah, the time is nigh. And she leaves and uh, leaves half her workers and these baby queens. And they hatch out and they just sting and bite and kill each other. And the one that survives gets to take over. And as I was driving home, I really wanted to do it to people. <laughs> and that's where it came from. I just want to say I'm glad you did it to people because there is a book called The Bees and it was just about the bees. The bees. Like it was not a metaphor. It was the bee POV. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, oh. so serious. My friend read it and she was like, this was, it was a bizarre, and she reads like pretty bizarre books, but she was like, this was one of the more bizarre reading experiences of her life. Yeah. Like, wow, you just, just went for the bees. Yeah. She's just like, yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder what her research must have been like, like to really get in that mind. You know, was she just like, you know? Just yeah, I don't know. Like, uh, I'm just going to work. That's all I'm going to do. You know, put herself there. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I think my friend was like, it wasn't as... It wasn't as weird as it could have been, but because it wasn't as weird as it could have been, it made it weirder because they were more human aligned than like actual like worker bees or whatever. Sorry, we're getting off <laughs> to, to a weird place, but I was just like, you could have done the bee thing and it would have found a market. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. What about you? Oh, me. Star Wars. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, Star Wars, Star Wars and Tolkien, those are the sort of two holy grails whenever I'm writing, and they're always sort of um, hanging in the background. With Star Wars, it's I'm one of the few people that really loves the prequel trilogy. I feel like I say this at every event. Um, yeah. This is, there's only been one other event where someone has cheered me for that. Usually I'm heckled. <laughs> Um, but there, with the prequel trilogy, one of my friends said something really interesting to me where he was like, well, you're a literature PhD, so of course you would be, like, interested in a broken object, was how he framed it to me. He was like, they're, well, I mean, they, they, they're rife with all of these problems, and so my scholar's mind is like, here are all of the ways that you can fix them, and here are all of the ways where all of these tensions and disruptions are weird and interesting. And that is how I approach the prequel trilogy is, when, I'm, when I have writer's block, I watch Phantom of the Phantom Menace because I just fix that movie as I'm, writing, as I'm working, and it helps loosen other problems in my head with my own projects. Um, but I also really love the Lush costuming, um, and I saw the Star Wars costume exhibit when it was here at Mopop three or four years ago, um, and all of the placards were like, this is from East Asia, this is from Mongolia, this is from the Ottoman Empire. There are no brown people in Star Wars. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to fix that. Yeah. Um, and then with Tolkien, I just love history. And so like, I always have these like huge codexes that never make it into the books that I'm writing. Um, but I always have like reams of mythology and folklore and poetry and stuff that makes the world feel more filled out so that even if it doesn't make it into the book, it feels like if you lift the curtain, you can see the rest of it. Um, yeah, Samia and I are friends in real life, yes. and so I happen to know that when you start a new project, you by the time I think I even hear about it, you're like, well, here's the history of this world back 700 years, and the, the lineage of my main character is, and I'll, I'm like, oh my god. I think the last time we did a retreat together, I drew her a diagram of like the, the god pantheon or something, yeah. where I was like, here's what you need to know to understand the first 10 pages of my book, and she was like, no. <laughs> It's like about that ten pages. <laughs> right. What happens in those? Like yeah. no. I was like, so you you like the Silmarillion, huh? I wouldn't have guessed. If you follow me on Twitter, all I've been doing recently is yelling about the Lord of the Rings revival. It's gonna be a very difficult time for me. <laughs> are you are you not like titillated by the thought of hot Sauron? Oh my god. <laughs> I literally have a tweet where I'm like. My, really, because I'm really concerned about the map, right? The map is really bad because all of the brown countries are empty, which is terrible. And also, I don't want to see, like, Amazon's take on maybe the servants of the enemy are complex. But also, on top of that, I should. what I'm really worried about is people being like, Anatar is so hot, and I ship Sauron and Celebrimbor. Like, that's going to be a really hard time for me, guys, because the fandom hasn't changed since 98, and now they're going to get on-screen rep, and it's going to be really bad. <laughs> That is a scary thing. The fans should never get what they want. No. <laughs> no. That realize madness. In the Shadow of War game, Shelob is a hot lady. She's a spider, guys. Yeah, ew. I found that so weird. It was so weird, and they, like, gave her, like, a sex plot with Sauron, and her origin story now is that she became a spider because she's Sauron's spurned lover. Wow. This is what we're dealing with, guys. <laughs> Wow. That's what happens to you? That's what, that's literally what happens is like, he's literally like, sorry, it's just politics. And then like it cuts to her in Kirith Ungol becoming a spider. Wow. Well, that's one way to go, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I Sometimes don't. I just take it that bad. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Wow. All right. We've done Star Wars and Lord of the Rings now. <laughs> I think we are. We're good. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> um, okay. So let's actually talk about world building, because we talked about inspiration and like how these stories come to life, but you build like a really great, I really love the like Stars Hollow of the West Coast idea. Um, and it's so lived in and it felt like, I told Sarah like ha for, for half of the book, I thought this place was a real town because it felt like I could go to Google Maps and drop the little pixel guy in there and like walk around. <laughs> um, so like how do you do that and then build your island be colony of people? <laughs> Well, I, well, thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. It, it really, like, I grew up reading fantasy the whole way, and I keep, like, I, I'm so happy to get the chance to talk about this. Like, even though I'm writing contemporary, I think I really approach it the same way. Like, I, I still really want, at the beginning of every chapter or every scene or every sh um, setting shift, to put my reader where they are and what it, what it smells like and what the details are that I notice. And 
um, what that world feels like. So that's really important. Like setting is really important to me as a reader. So as a writer, I really prioritize it. And then um, I like that I, I'm, I'm happy that it feels lived in because these were definitely characters that I felt really fondly about, um, especially over time. Uh, like the guy that owns the photography store is so weird and his relationship with this cat is so weird and I just love them. Um, so I wanted it to I wanted it to feel like Stars Hollow where people or Parks and Recreation where you meet someone for the first time and they obviously have this whole life. You only see the tip of the iceberg, but you kind of get the sense that if you sat down with that person, they'd have a weird, cool story to tell you. Um, so so I really did prioritize setting and um, characterization in that way, kind of leaving breadcrumbs and hopefully leaving people with a sense that this was a bigger world. I wish that uh, writers of contemporary books would get asked about world building more. Yeah. Like fantasy writers, we get asked about that all the time. All the time. But building a contemporary world is the same thing. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. Like all of your characters, like all of the people who live in this town, feel like they live in this town. Like they belong in this town. They each have their place in this town. Yeah, yeah. And you can just imagine them, you know, doing their own thing when they're not on the page. Yeah. So. Good. Yeah. So, Side note about weird cats, when yeah. she introduced you, I thought you meant that your cat was probably eating enchiladas right now. <laughs> to be honest, maybe. Probably. He, he would eat them. He is the cat that eats human food, all human food. He doesn't care. So, <laughs> you know, my. No, we're not going to do another diversion. <laughs> but we were asking you about world building. Oh, yeah, I don't want to tell you now that I know how Samaya does it. Oh, no. <laughs> I really don't. It's I'm the extreme version. So no one should feel bad that they don't have 10,000 words of codex history because that's, that's like my ADHD hyperfixation at work and not normal. <laughs> did, you, did you go by the seat of your pants or did you? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time with characters before I start writing. So a character and a world will be in my head for at least a year and a half. I would say just floating around there and trying to convince me that it's an actual book. I'm always very skeptical of my ideas. Like, you're not a book. You're a short story, aren't you? <laughs> and, you know, so I just make them hang out there. And if they hang out for a year and a half, I figure they must know what they're doing. But by then, I've had a lot of interaction with the characters and heard their voices and kind of just strolled around in my imagination. But as far as going deep into, like, the history and the what everything looks like, no, I just throw myself in there and then I look. I'm like, oh yeah, there's that building. I'll write about that. <laughs> and oh yeah, there's that person. I'll write about her. So, no, I didn't even have like a timeline of queens, like a history of queens until I think in the middle of book two. But I would, I mean, I think that it feels so lived in too. I mean, in the same way, I felt like every page brought another detail and you kind of hinted at the, the lore of the island. There's kind of a magic to it. I, yeah. I, I always think of that Stephen King quote where he's like writing is just like pulling a string up out of the ground you know it's already there you just have to mine for it and that really feels to me what writing is like it's just as I go along I'm learning about it too and somehow it just happens to make sense yeah so you're not plotting at all no wow that is wild, isn't it? <laughs> I yeah. wish I would just outline for once. I was going to say, you're currently writing the, the last book, is that right? Yes. How is that plotting going? Well, I've made it through the first draft, so, I mean, that's the important part. That's and now amazing. I can just go back. Yeah. So now I know how everything ends. Oh, good. Okay, okay. I won't ask about that. <laughs> how about you? Oh, I mean, we've talked about my... But the other, the other thing, too, is with me for world building is that because I have ADHD, my brain does this. So if I don't have the background, then I just sort of spin my wheels. And every time I'm like, I don't need it, I'll be stuck for like three months. And then I'm like, OK, you got to sit down and do. Like, I've, I've tried it before. And it's like, you're, my brain can't latch on to like thematic imagery or anything that, that you need to make the fantasy work if I don't have the background to pull from at will. And I use, and I use the stuff a lot. Like, I'm, I can't. Every time I'm like, I can write this scene without a micro outline. My brain's like, no, you can't, though. And also, I just want to be clear. We're talking about your books as though it is going to be like a codex when you read it. That's not the case. Yeah, like, no. Sameo makes these amazing background documents. and You have the whole history of yeah. the world. And then your books are like emotions on the page. Like, it's so character-based. It's so, like, in your feelings. Like, I, like, I respond to your writing on, like, a very emotional basis. Oh, so I just want to make sure that we're well, not... I understand, like, I love the Sumerian, but I also understand, like, as a text, it doesn't work for most readers because it reads like a textbook, and so I don't do that. 
<laughs> I go out of my you. way not not to do that. <laughs> um, Very wise. <laughs> um, let's let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So we all have characters who are trying to exert power over their destiny or their environment, and they're successful in like differing ways. Um, are we, are you guys like intentionally playing with the ways that? Like teenagers can be powerless in the face of like power structures and that sort of thing. Um, I I think yes, <laughs> I think yes. I was I like it took me until the third draft of the writing, burning it down, writing, burning it down, and then on the last draft, I was like, you know what, this book is missing is a villain because I think I truly am a fantasy writer who is like struggling. But I was like, I need a villain um, to cast this as, and up until that point in the book, the social media app is called Veil. Vale. And I had only hinted at its origins. And then in the final draft, I was like, who built this thing? Oh, really? So that's how I got to a character named Rake Bermkazerg, which is an anagram of Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> and he is the villain of my book. I was, I, that is when everything clicked in place for me. And I was like, this is part of what Ivy is, is struggling against, is like how we're allowed to express ourselves. What does it mean to stand in your in your own as an artist. Like to me, she's a young artist and as a young artist you need to make stuff and fail. And it was so easy to fail back in the day when no one saw what you were doing until you were like 37. Um, but now you put whatever is going on in your life on Instagram and it looks, and, and if you make a mistake or get a bad haircut, then you are publicly having that bad haircut. I can't imagine that. So um, I wanted it to I wanted to examine how that was to be a young artist now when you have to fail out loud in a way that um, I think we were all preserved from to some extent because we were a little bit too old for that. Um, so so that was that's kind of where I went with it. How about your teen oh, girls? That's an interesting way of putting it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's, I, did, I would never have guessed that, that he was the last, a, a final draft edition because I mean. He was, he so was waiting, throughout. obviously. You know? Yeah. <laughs> He's one of my favorites. That was fun. That was fun. Good. Um, I uh, I don't know. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Your teen teen oh, girls right. railing against the system. I uh, I never set out to deliberately do much with the characters. I kind of just know who they are, and then I let them go and see <laughs> what happens. I if there was something that I was trying to do deliberately this time, it was. I mean, I, I set it intentionally within a matriarchy. So it's all females in the power structure. They control the religion, they control the government, and obviously they are queens. Um, women are the head of the household. So, And going through the writing, that was kind of an interesting process because I kept catching myself doing patriarchal stuff without realizing it. I think I called um, fishermen fishermen for three drafts before I realized that the job would not be gendered there. And then um, I gave people the wrong last name because they would take their mother's last name and not, you know... So inheritances run the opposite. It was just, it was, it was very strange. Yeah, and I'll still like catch my, we're, we were like three books in and the last name thing came up again and it was one of the senior editors at the, at the publisher and they're like, wouldn't they be this name? Like, no, no, haven't you been paying attention? It's three books now, it's like they would take the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it, it. it just sticks in your head. So, I mean, I didn't blame them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so interesting. There's a book that just came out last week um, by Lilium Rivera called Dealing in Dreams. Um, and it also imagines a future society that's matriarchal and really, really cool and interesting stuff that she does with that. But I mean, I love how your, your queens are, and I want to know how, how you dealt with this in Mirage too, because they're queens, but they are, to begin the series, like very powerless. Yeah, they like, definitely start off as pawns. Yeah, because, being controlled. Know, yeah, like teenage girls are. You know, they have to find their power wherever it may lie. So, yeah. But I, I can't say that I set that up with that in my mind because I didn't. <laughs> well, it seemed that way. Well, thank you. You seem very smart. <laughs> How about you? Your, your characters deal with being a princess but being a pawn at the same time. Yeah. I also don't think that I did that on purpose, like Kandara. I think I just, because it's, it's I don't think of, Maram as a princess, and I don't think of Amani as like a princess stand-in. To me, the things that, that render both of them powerless are their positions in the colonial power structure and how Maram is, a, is biracial, so she's one half colonized or one half colonized. Um, and then Amani is colonized, and, that, and both of them look like the colonized um, population. Um, 
And so I guess to me, what I was thinking about is like the ways in which they just, they just, you just don't have power and you sort of have to survive that way. And that's compounded by being a teenage girl where you don't have any legal status. Um, you basically don't have any rights, you know. Um, and, but teenage girls find a way to, to survive and to, to do the stuff that they need to do, right. Um, and I think that that's what I was, I was thinking of instead of, it's, my, my friend Anna got her master's in kid lit and her thesis was about princesses and she finished my book and she was like, I wish I could have written my book about your book. And I was like, my book is not about, it is about princesses, but it, I don't think of it that way. And I, it's not because, it's not for a reason. It's just like when I think of Maram, I just think of like, she's a mean girl who's going through it. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's the delight about young adult literature is yeah. that we can write about whatever we want and then it ends up being, like, a high school allegory. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah. I mean, and hers is a more extreme case, you know. Um, but, yeah, but she's she's just, she's going through puberty and adolescence, and it's really hard. Yeah. And it has global Im uh, space. Yeah, her tantrums have, like, global impact. <laughs> I think we probably can do one more question and then audience um, question. Well, I really like this one. Do you want to do the debut question or do you want to do the enemies question? Oh, well, I already answered the enemy question. Oh, that's true. So we can do the debut one. Okay. Um, so Sarah and I, I debuted last year and Sarah just debuted, but we'd, we've also been around for a minute, like yes. 10 years. 10 years. Has it really been 10, 10 years? 2009. Yeah. Is when I started writing, yeah. like January 2009. Wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I was, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask that too because you've been in book world. For a long time, so is it strange? Yeah, to be very strange. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Do you, that's kind of the question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, how strange is it being a debut now, even though you have all of this experience? And how does how do you think it compares to like other people's debut experiences? I mean, it was interesting. Last just last night, I did an event with Nina Lacour and Jennifer Smith, and they are so awesome. I love them. Um, and they've both been published for ten and eleven years, actually, oh, wow. which I didn't realize until I was like sharing my story. Um, and, and they were talking about how, what they did or didn't do for their debut book. I think that um, I do have, I feel lucky that I'm debuting now because I know what to expect. After being around for a long time and having a lot of friends who are published, I knew kind of what the disappointments were going to be, what the exciting parts were going to be. Um, it didn't change that I went on an emo emotional roller coaster, but I did know that it was an emotional roller coaster, so I could kind of say, like, oh, I'm in this stage right now. Um, and that was really lucky. So, but it's hard to say this without sounding like a brat. But yeah, I've been writing and been in YA and doing the podcast um, first draft for four years now. Um, that, it, that when people started asking me questions about being a debut, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I guess that's true. <laughs> Yeah, you, are, you have to be much more savvy than the average debut. I, I think know? I have a lot more information. Yeah. And, and what that truth, truthfully has meant is that my expectations are appropriately, like, very, very low. Um, and that has been very, very good for my ego and sense of uh, normalcy, which, uh, which I only would have known by seeing so many people go through it. How about you when you, you debuted in August? Oh, yeah. Um... <laughs> It feels like a million years ago. Um, yeah. I think for me, the, the most important thing, because I see this and I sound like whatever, I see this in a lot of debuts is that they come in and they don't have any writing community. And I think that that's been the sort of saving grace um, for this entire process is that like because I've been in, in YA for so long, I have really, really good friends. Um, who are really good checks for me and are, who are also really good source of, sources of information. And I think that the place that a lot of debuts stumble is that they're alone and so they don't have information. They don't understand how, either how unique their experiences are or how, like, yeah, this happens to everyone. It yeah, they don't, they don't have the context. Yeah, they don't have the context for, for their debut. Um, and so a lot of the things that, like, like you said, that, like, could have, that shatter a lot of writers and then upset them deeply, I was like, yeah, but I've literally definitely heard worse. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like, there's, it could always be worse. Yes. And I mean, we, I, I feel like then also it's nice to be doing, to have my first book come out, but to be placing myself in, you know, I'm thinking about the next book and yeah. I, I want to make this a career. Yeah. And seeing Kandara, this is your like third series. 
Yeah. Basically. So, I mean, like, having friends like you who, are, who have made shifts and done, gone on to do many different things, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, whatever happens with this book, it's one step yeah. of, of many steps. It's the hope, anyway. Yeah. And you, ha I don't know if you want to talk about it, but you had, you sold a book before your, even, it was even Oh, more. yeah, yeah. When I, when I was a wee lass. <laughs> Um, when I was in my senior year of college, I sold a book to a dream editor who was amazing, who had an amazing reputation. She had published John Green, and I thought it was like going to be the making of me. And then she also didn't have an assistant, so I didn't hear from her for like three years. Um, and then by then, I had kept writing because that's what you should do. Um, and I had just become more of a sci-fi writer, like more. I had become more and more genre, and she was very much not. I mean, she publishes John Green. Um, and eventually, she was like, "I don't think that I know how to edit this." Maybe we should part ways. And it's like, at one point during that process, I was like, literally the worst thing that could happen to me is that my book would get canceled and I would never be able to recover from that. And then it happened and I was fine. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, yeah. And it's just, it's one of those experiences where when it's happening, you're like, this is literally the worst possible outcome. Um, but also I think if that book had gotten published, um, I would not be a happy camper. <laughs> yeah. You know, totally. like there's just like... And not to sound cheesy, but, like, oftentimes the, the, like, path you didn't choose, you didn't choose it for a reason. Like, you didn't walk it for a reason. Yeah, I like that. Um, so, anyway, we're old hags up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being treated like fresh new faces. Um, so, uh, I think we can do audience yeah. questions. Um, if anybody has a question about the books or the podcast or anything. How here. many episodes has the podcast at now? Oh, what a good question. <laughs> it is, I think, uh, I just released, I think, 181. Wow. wow. Yeah. So, nice. thank yeah. you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, if you guys enjoy this conversation, there is a lot of hours more of similar conversation available to you at your, at your choosing. Yeah. Yeah, it's been going on for four years. Wow. I know. Any other questions? Oh boy. Um, so a couple of things. I use Scrivener, um, which is uh, a writing app where you can split things into folders. And so there's like a codex folder. Um, I think it's called research or something, but I always rename it as codex. And then I'll split it into um, history. This, I'm trying to figure out how much of myself I should out here. Um, <laughs> I have like I have people of note, history, mythology, historiography, which is like the competing accounts of things, and that only that's only happened with one book that no one's read yet. So, um, and then I I also recently paid fifty dollars for Aeon Timeline, which is timeline software, and I made a thousand year timeline because I'm that writer. <laughs> I like how my exaggerated story of the 700 years was actually not long enough. I know, but when I did that, I managed to write the book. Yes. And it's, yeah. it was a book that had been stumping me for two years, and it like finally unlocked. So. I like your writing advice. Go back a thousand years. Don't. Don't. Um, because the other thing, too, is that like, that timeline never appears in the book. Like, I finished writing the book now. It does not make an appearance in the book. Like, two people out of the timeline and, like, two events out of the timeline appear in the book. The rest of it is just there for me to know and be really happy about. Like, I, I have the app open, and sometimes I just scroll through it because it's also color-coded. <laughs> I actually, I have a question, Kendra, about when you do a series, your publisher has to be, like, tracking that to make sure that continuity is maintained, is that right? How do you, well, how I mean, do you guys? think so. <laughs> oh, but, no. you know, I mean, no, uh, there's a mistake <laughs> in the first edition of Two Dark Reigns. Um, the previous three queens on the island were all poisoners. Uh, poisoner is a specific magical gift that you can have that it just allows you to eat all the poison you want and not get sick. Um, and their names are Sylvia, Nicola, and Camille. But in an earlier draft, it was Sandrine, Nicola, and Camille. And sure enough, in Two Dark Rains, I all of a sudden start calling them Sandrine instead of Sylvia. I'm like, ah. Oh, and how, who, how did you find out about that? A reader, of course. Yeah. I was going to say, the, the true continuity checks yeah. are the readers. Yeah. So then I went to my editor. I'm like, can we get that? You know. And in reprints, it's, it's fixed, but it's embarrassing. You're only human. <laughs> but usually that is someone's job. 
September 3rd, assuming I finish it. <laughs> yes, Kandara is taking a, a break from, from writing to be here with us, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, go for it. Oh boy. Um, that's like the whole process for me. So the first draft is horrible. Um, it's like not fun for me. I don't like a single moment of it. Um, and I have to force myself to get through it and I have to outline a bunch and re-outline a whole bunch. And then, um, and then revisions happen. And every time that you open up your document, you somehow find a way to make it better, usually. And that is a um, wonderful feeling. So I kind of, I, I'll read through the book once I've taken time away, that's a huge, huge important step. Take time away, go back, read through the book, take notes as you go, come up with a plan for revisions, and then just kind of like go through the thing and make the changes. I go chronologically the whole time. Um, and then I have beta readers go and repeat, rinse, repeat a couple, two or three times. Um, and then my agent is very editorial, so she basically, let me do it with the agent uh, all over again. Yeah, how about you guys? Uh, it's, it's different for me for every book. So um, my debut, Anna Dressed in Blood, was a horror book about murderous ghosts. And my revision process was basically at a lunchroom scene. And hey, could you not have your ghost eat a waffle? Because she's dead. <laughs> and I was like, I know, I'm sorry. I was hungry. I was hungry. I hadn't had a Belgian waffle in a really long time. And she hadn't had one in even longer. So I just thought, give one to her. Uh, yeah, so that went. But then for Three Dark Crowns, it's more like I'll finish the draft. I'm like, this is pretty sweet. <laughs> and then it'll sit for three months and I'll be like, oh God, it's so terrible. And sure enough, it really is terrible. So I'll rewrite the whole thing from top to tails uh, a few times usually. Wow. And, then, uh, and then my editor will say, do more, and then I'll do it one more time. And then maybe, maybe that one will be the one. Do you save chapters? Are you able to save anything when you... I always think I'm going to be able to, but no. Wow. Wait, so you rewrite from scratch? Not from scratch. Okay. Like everything that happened, like most of the stuff that happened, happened. I'm just telling it so badly. Like I don't even speak words <laughs> anymore. So it just has, yeah. like my sentence structure is terrible. I'm just, I'm just crap. So. But you have the, the body but of the it. the bones. Yeah. yeah. Is there usually? Yeah. I mean, sometimes. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have to pull out an entire half of a novel and put a whole new half in that completely different stuff happens. That sucks. I don't like it. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. How about you? Um, mostly it's like adding and deleting. Um, oh. Yeah. So I'll, like, I'll walk away from a draft and then come back and be like, because um, I'm also a really intense outliner. I bet no one could have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. <laughs> um, so before I even draft, I have like a 6,000 word document or spreadsheet where it's like, Here's everything that, that needs to happen. Um, and so sometimes it changes when I'm writing or whatever, but usually by the time I have, I have a first draft, like the bones are pretty solid and the plot beats are there. And it's like you haven't lingered in this emotional beat long enough or you, you like this doesn't make sense because you haven't scaffolded it right. Um, and so you need, to, you need to add these chapters in or these scenes in and you need to get rid of this because this doesn't make sense. Um, that sort of thing is usually what I'm doing when I'm revising. Do you think using Scrivener makes that easier for you? Yeah, because the other thing, too, that always ends up happening is someone goes, well, this should have happened before this chapter. And Scrivener is great because it has a corkboard function with summaries. Um, and so I just end up moving stuff around on the corkboard. And then I really love color coding stuff. So I'll, like, label <laughs> the scenes. I mean, like, this needs to change. This needs to go. Um, this needs to be moved. It is so handy for moving. Yeah, around. it's so like gone are the days of scrolling and yeah. scrolling and copying and pasting and scrolling yeah. and scrolling. Like, yeah, like I don't Good even stuff. I don't write my chapters on one thing anymore. Like the chapters have folders in the and in the chapters are the scenes, so I can move a single scene without yep. breaking up the chapter. Dang. Yeah, nice. it's really, really nice. It's really, really nice. And if for any of you writers out there who haven't tried it yet, it's like thirty bucks. Yeah, yeah, and it's so cheaper worth if the money. you're a student. If you have a student email. Mm -hmm. Scrivener, we, we support it. Yeah. Yeah. We probably, we, I think we do one more question and then we'll do a signing if anybody has. I warned these ladies before we did it that my mom was going to ask about their books and she did. <laughs> <laughs> There's something everyone in this room should take away about radioactive waste. Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> my God. <laughs> what a dream. Thank you for asking that question. 
Uh, so I did. I out of college. I one of my first my first gig was writing about radioactive waste for a trade publication that dealt the, about all kinds of energy. And truly, I was I think the only reporter in the U.S. that was focused solely on radioactive waste for four years. You guys, what a life. It was crazy. <laughs> um, I was 23, just bopping around the U.S., going to all these conferences and talking to lawyers and policymakers and um, and so many engineers. Um, I, and I guess the TLDR of it is I support nuclear power. So I walked away from talking to that many scientists and that many people and sitting through all those meetings, and I was like, you know, this seems like a pretty good deal, um, except the problem is with the waste, uh, because we currently have a hollowed out mountain in Nevada, and the people of Nevada that live near that mountain really want us to send our radioactive waste there, and that was the plan the whole time, but uh, the people that live in Las Vegas were like, what? That sounds horrible. We don't want to do that. So now we have a hollowed out mountain with no waste inside of it, and waste is sitting at nuclear power plants across the country um, without it wasn't meant to be doing that, and it's like 30 years old, and it's just a, a ripe target. I have a question. Yeah. Because now I'm like, <laughs> so is the mountain, I guess because the, like the buzzword with radioactive waste is that like it's going to do radiation and you're going to get stuff like cancer and stuff like that. And so right. is the idea that the mountain is shielded enough to maintain like the radioactivity? Yes. Okay. Exactly. And it would be housing the, the waste. Oh, here we go. There's, there's <laughs> waste A, B, and C. B and C are the bad stuff. Okay. Uh, a is like your clothes and stuff. Yeah. Um, B and C are already put in special containers. So those special containers will be put inside other special containers and put inside a mountain, which Ooh, itself okay. is a special container. So, you know, hypothetically, it's... I mean, and hypothetical is all we have. They've done the math out to 10,000 years, I think. Yeah. Uh, be, uh, the math they have to do is so nuts. It's like, what if a farmer one day drilled into the middle of your thing, and uh, in 10,000 years in the future, he was using that water to feed his cow or whatever. Yeah. It's like they have to like do these models with little Microsoft Word people. Um, so it's pretty impressive science. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the fact is we have a mountain for it, and it shouldn't be sitting just like on cement slabs all over the right. country. Is this a naturally occurring hollow mountain, or did like no, somebody no. go to the trouble of hollowing that bad boy out. We have hollowed just... out. American workers hollowed out a damn mountain that we're not using it. <laughs> so there's probably a dragon. <laughs> there's probably a dragon in it now, honestly. Um, thank you so much for that question. I never get to talk about this. I have so many feelings. Um, you guys, this was so fun. Thank you so much for coming and thank you guys for joining me. Oh yeah, wait. Yes, I would love to answer your question. Maddie, what a great question. Thank you so much. Um, I have written another book that also takes place in Sudden Cove. It is. It has not sold yet, but I think if I keep talking about it, someone will just buy it. Um, <laughs> it's with my agent right now, so we're, it's going to go through a whole bunch more revisions. But actually, the book, uh, that book predates Tell Me Everything. It's a book I started writing in 2012. Sumeya's read it a couple times. It made me cry. Yay! I know that's not easy for you. <laughs> <laughs> easier recently than, than ever before. Um, so I'm really hoping that, so it'll be, it's about different characters, but it's in the same town, and it's another contemporary story, and I'm, uh, it has punk rock and <laughs> slightly less Jeff, Jeff Goldblum, but maybe in revisions that will get fixed. <laughs> Thank you, Madison. Good question. I think, I think we can go ahead and sign books now, you guys. Thank you so much for coming, everybody.